Good morning. All right. Well, Karen and I have been here almost 11 years, but never seen the church from this side. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> uh, so it's good to see you all. Uh, you know, our, our theme this time right now is, is Be the Light. And so I thought maybe we could spend some time and have some practical advice for how to be the light. <clears throat> And so the context of this is the Sermon on the Mount. So here is Jesus speaking to a lot of people. And while he's doing that, this is what he says to all the people. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So the interesting thing I thought is in the context of this, he's, it's to all these people on this huge mountain, and he's not saying these 12 disciples are the light of the world or these people that are really faithful, they're the light of the world. He's saying to all these people on this hill, you are the light of the world. <clears throat> I thought that was interesting. And then I looked at how he actually sends people out. So when Jesus actually sent the disciples out, he did so by, doing, by calling them in pairs. It says, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. And if you look at where the disciples are actually listed out in Matthew, they're in pairs. Uh, so these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, the first pair. Then James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, the second pair. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. And the last pair, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And so the scholars I was looking at think these are the actual pairings that Jesus sent out. And this pattern continued when Jesus sent out even more people. So he sent out 72 people. And this is a bit later. He says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to go to every town and place where he was about to go. And this continues even after Jesus died, was resurrected, was sent on to heaven. Here we have... Uh, there's Saul, and so he used to be a persecutor of Christians, and then he became an uh, evangelist. And, but towards the beginning of his ministry, he was still called Saul. He wasn't called Paul yet, and he was in Antioch. And so here's the situation. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucy of Caesarean, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So there's this group in this church in Antioch. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So when Saul, later we called Paul, first starts out, he's paired with somebody and they go out and do this ministry. Same thing happens later. On the second journey, you have Paul and Silas. And then they were joined by Timothy. Now, interesting thing on the second journey. So they start out this way. And then after they've been ministering together and going to the different towns, Paul splits off and goes to Athens by himself. He has a very famous sermon to an, un, you know, uh, they had a, a place there for, uh, you know, they had worshipped all these different gods. They had a place there for an unknown god in case they missed one. And he gave a famous speech and he said, hey, Jesus is the one you've been looking for. Great. But it's one of the few places where he didn't actually establish a church when he was off by himself. So Paul realized that he's more effective when he's with somebody. And so he took people. This is a list um, of the people he took with him. You'll recognize some famous people up there. You know, Luke, 
Titus, Timothy, you know, all these people. I mean, he's got quite a group that goes with him on all his missionary trips and um, when he's ministering. And so, so I put these two thoughts together. So you are the light of the world. You will often work with other people to share the light. So some practical advice from the Bible on how to work with people to be the light would be helpful. So that's what we're covering today. So first thing, working with other people. Communication. Right? So you have to communicate with other people to do anything. So you might think to yourself, okay, I want to communicate. How, what am I going to say to them and how am I going to get them to do stuff? Well, go back to Proverbs. The first thing it says about this is, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and shame. So you probably know uh, or have been in this situation where you're talking with somebody and they already have an answer for you. Right? They're not thinking about what you've said or um, taking into account the arguments you've made. They already know what they're going to say, and, and they say it back to you. You, you could have stopped talking five minutes ago. Um, so, well, that, in Proverbs, Solomon, the wisest man, says, you know, that's not a good idea. Um, so you should listen and accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. So you're listening first. And finally, he, you know, to drive home the point, do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And, you know, in Proverbs, a fool, you know, there's not a lot going on, uh, you know, to help people there. It's, you know, the fool's doing all these bad things. Well, okay, you're, there's more hope for that person than for the person who speaks in haste. So, so first is listening. And, and there's one way you can find out if you're actually listening well. It's if you can talk to the people, even somebody who's disagreeing with you, and present their arguments to them in such a way that they believe you've heard them. So, let's say you're talking to somebody about the fastest way to get to Dallas. And you're like, dude, the fastest way to get to Dallas is on a plane. Like, it's going 500 miles an hour. And you're like, no, 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 you gotta drive. You know, driving's better, and you're like, no, plane. So, if you can say to that person, look, I understand why you think the plane is slower, because you have to get to the airport earlier and check in, and there could be delays with the flights, and you gotta fly there, and then near the airport, you gotta get a car. They'll be more receptive to arguments you may have about, well, there's traffic, or I always have to stop for kolaches, or whatever it is that slows you down <laughs> on the way to Dallas. Um, so so that, that's the, uh, the issue with, with communicating, is um, so um, listening first. Okay, so now you've listened, and you need to state your message. So if you go to, back in the Bible and you think about great communicators. The first one that came to my mind was John the Baptist. The first thing he says is, <clears throat> repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And very clear, right? What more does he need to say? Repent, the kingdom of heaven comes near. But when some other people come to listen to him, he adapts his message. Here's what, he, here's what happens. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So why was that necessary? So he adapted his message because he knew that if somebody just heard repent for these people, if they just heard repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, they would say, oh, you know, I'm covered. Uh, you know, Abraham's my ancestor. I don't need to listen to what you're saying. So he specifically addressed them because he knew what their thought process would be. So to, to emphasize this in a little more detail, I have some helpers that will, are going to demonstrate this point. So I'll move this over here. And we're in an office setting. And we have two employees, employee number one and employee number two. Different parts of the office. 
sitting down, doing their work, and the boss. Okay, thank you very much, guys. We'll give them a All right. Thanks. All right, so exact same message received completely differently. And why is that? Well, people interpret things differently from how you might expect. There's all kinds of reasons. There could be gender, race, ethnicity, national origin, impact of disability, style of communication in the family when they were growing up, birth order, life tensions, and more. There could be work pressures. There could be economic stresses, their social status relative to you. And there's a lot of things here, you know, history of stuff. And, and so all kinds of reasons why somebody may interpret a message differently than you had intended. So that's why John adapted his message, because he knew that people would receive it differently. We see that pattern even in the very structure of the Bible itself. We have four Gospels, because each presents the life of Christ for a different audience. In, Jesus, in, in Matthew, he's presenting to the Jewish people. And so his take is, Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So that's why he points out that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that's the fulfillment of prophecy from the book of Micah. That when Jesus was born of a virgin, that's the fulfillment of prophecy found in Isaiah. Even the fact that Jesus taught in parables. Matthew explicitly says he taught in parables, and by the way, guys, this is a fulfillment of prophecy found in Psalms. So he explicitly calls all those things out so that the Jewish people who knew all these prophecies would say, oh yes, he is the fulfillment of these. If we go to Mark, he's writing to the Romans. And so he had to explain things Jewish people would not have needed explanation for. For example, he explained that when Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, he was sitting opposite the temple. Okay, so that would be like explaining that the Alamo is in San Antonio. You don't need to explain that to a Texan, but somebody from Germany might need that. Or even he explained that the day of the unleavened bread was when they killed the Passover lamb, right? So every Jewish person, would know, like we know that Halloween is when you trick or treat or Christmas is when you give presents. Somebody in India might not know that, so he explained. So he's explaining those other things that Matthew wouldn't have done. And he emphasized action for the Romans who were an action oriented people. So then we go to Luke and he is talking to the Greeks. Now, the Greeks were interested in the perfection of the human. So, you know, they started the Olympics, and that was all about glorifying the human body and understanding the perfect human body. They were very influential in establishing branches of philosophy because they were looking at the human mind and how to have the perfect human mind and the thinking and the logical parts of that. And so, um, so Luke emphasized that humanity and showing that Jesus was the perfect example of humanity. And he talked about Jesus' human side. So the human side of Jesus praying to the Father. You know, 11 of the 15 prayers in the New Testament that Jesus prayed were in Luke. And Luke shows the humanity showing that the most, you know, we read the, at Christmas we read from Luke because it's the most complete example. 
of the humanity, the birth, and the childhood. And he traces lineage back to Adam because that's showing that humanity of Jesus. Finally, we get to John, and John is talking to everybody, uh, showing that Jesus is the Son of God, part of the Trinity, not just a great human. So my father's from India, and in India, many people believe in the Hindu religion. And the Hindu religion, any way you want to get to God, that's great. You want to get to God through Jesus, fine, through Muhammad, hey, that works, through Buddha, Vishnu, whatever. They're fine with that. They're, they're Exact philosophy is, you know, there's many different ways to get to, to heaven. Um, I remember, you know, I grew up in a, uh, I went to church on every Sunday and, and then, you know, it was in a Christian school and, and my dad took me to one of these uh, Indian cultural events and this guy is talking about their philosophy and, you know, I'd always heard, you know, okay, one way to, you know, the way, the truth, and life, all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Why do you keep saying that? And we get to this, this little uh, talk this guy's giving, he's like, oh yeah, however you want to get there, that's, that's fine. I'm like, oh, okay, I understand why that message is there. So John was addressing that issue. So he gives many examples of the miracles of Jesus, and he quotes Jesus extensively when he talks about how to be saved. You know, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine. He's talking about Okay, Jesus is the only way. There aren't many ways to get there. So, so these four Gospels are adapting the message, still telling about the life of Jesus for the specific audience. And then this continues. If we look at Paul again, so Paul was a great communicator, right? Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and did all these trips and, and you know, got lots of people saved. And, and how did he do that? He tells us, he says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but a man are Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So, to conclude the part about communication, the underlying premise here is that it's the responsibility of the communicator to ensure that the listener fully understands the message. And that can be a lot of work. I mean, you have to think about those, all those things that they may think differently from you and think about, okay, you know, their background and everything. But that is effective. You know, John changed his message and it was effective to those people. Okay, so now you're working with people, you've listened to them, you communicated to them, and now you're doing some sort of a project with them. You're being the light, you're working on something with them together. Four steps, right? You're going to define the work to be done, assign people to parts of the project, evaluate the work, evaluate the people. Straightforward. And so we can see in the Bible how this is applied in some of the great projects in the Bible. So when I, I think of great project, right, there's one that comes to mind, right? The great project, which is, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, Make rooms in it and coat with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So, you know, this is defining the problem. Although, I have to admit, if you gave me this problem, I wouldn't be able to build an ark. So, for me, this would be too high level, right? Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys could do it. Um, so, so, but if you give it too low level, that doesn't work either. It, if it's too low level, it doesn't allow for the flexibility of the person actually doing the work, and they'll get frustrated, and you know, it shows lack of trust in them. So, so but it's important because otherwise, you know, you guys get together, and you're like, okay, we're gonna do this project, you know, for children's church, and 
So some people might not do the right thing. You may do something related to, you know, well, I thought we would need to paint the walls, and, and so if the problem isn't clearly defined, then people are just going to do whatever. So here's another example of defining the problem. Uh, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I surely, and surely I am with you to always to the very end of the age. So this is the Great Commission. And Jesus is laying out, okay, here's what you're going to do, clearly defining, okay, you're going to go make disciples, baptize, and so on. So there's no misunderstanding. This is the problem. It's not also to, you know, help them to raise cattle or something. Okay. So, great. You've assigned the thing. Then the next part is assigning the people. So, uh, if you've ever been on a road trip, you know that after a while, people may not be as friendly with each other. So maybe you have kids in the car and you throw them in the car, you go for like eight hours, 10 hours, a week, a month. So Moses, here's his situation. He led the people out of Egypt and they're wandering around the desert for 40 years. So after a while, people start to get sort of, you know, bickering, arguing, and so, uh, and he's handling all this stuff. All these arguments are going to Moses. And so Moses' father-in-law comes to visit. And, you know, they have a meal, and, and they hang out, and then the next day, he watches. So here's what happened. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided for themselves. So this is where the work is being assigned to the people, and everybody knows what they're doing. You, know, you are over a thousand, you're over fifty, you're over ten, whatever it is. So it goes along with clearly defining the problem, then clearly defining who's going to do what. So, you know, if you're working in the children's thing on a project, you know, okay, you are going to be doing, you know, the punch outs, you're going to be doing the painting, you're going to be doing the um, toys, whatever it is. So everybody has, you know, what they need to do. Okay, that's great. Problems defined, everybody knows what they're doing, but Sometimes it doesn't always go according to plan. People flake out or the problems with the work, right? So next step is evaluating. So let's take another big project from the Bible. So the people of Israel sinned. They were taken into captivity. And then finally Cyrus the Great is like, okay, you guys can go back and rebuild your temple. So Ezra's leading this thing, and they go back to start rebuilding the temple. 
So they got to get the supplies. So then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people sitting in Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. So they get the people, the stonemasons, none of the supplies. And in the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, that's the temple that they're rebuilding, Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, Joshua, son of Zoradak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites who had returned from the capital of Jerusalem, began the work. They appointed Levites 20 years and older, old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Here's all the people evaluating what's going on. Joshua and his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Hedida and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. So, big project, work's been defined, assigned, and now lots of supervisors to make sure it gets done. Okay, that sounds great, but some people have a problem with telling other people, hey, you know, it's not quite right. You should maybe change what you're doing, or, you know, it'd be great if you could do it this way. Because they're thinking, you know, there's that verse, right? Don't judge people, right? This one. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. When the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's like, well, I can't tell anybody what to do because, you know, I don't want to get judged. And that same passage continues. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to the brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, right? So I can't tell these people, you know, they're doing it wrong because they'll judge me and, and that's bad. I don't want to get judged. Um, and how do I instruct them and correct them and, and have them do better? Well, let's read the verse that comes after this. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So he doesn't say, leave your brother alone. He says, take the log or plank out of your eye and then actually go help your brother with that speck. So he's warning you, you know, if you try to help people, you will be judged. So make sure you're doing the right thing and then go help your brother with the speck in his eye. Uh, another take on this is when Paul is writing to Timothy and, and he says, and the Lord's servant... He's referring to Timothy, who he's writing to, must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed. Otherwise, they will not know any better. Must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to his will. So, What's happening here is, you know, we, when we're working with people, we should not be fearful of saying, okay, well, maybe you should change how you're, you know, working on the children's project, you know, change how you're painting this, or maybe, you know, that's not quite working here, try a different approach, or, you know, uh, you're having a problem committing to doing this, you know, you said you would do it, and now you're not showing up, you know, uh, do you need help or something to actually get it working properly? So, if we take this in a business sense, when there's somebody who's not working out well, there are different things you can do. So, um, in a business, when somebody is you know, showing up late or not doing the work or all these different things that it's a problem, you can choose not to support them. And, Eventually, they'll do something that's a fireable offense, right? So they keep showing up late. Eventually, you know, they'll be like, okay, well, they've showed up late so many times. Sorry, you're fired, right? And just, you know, let them keep doing what they're doing, and they don't get along with people. Eventually, they're going to start yelling at folks and whatever. So you can make that choice as a business. You can choose as a business to support them, uh, give them classes, videos, counseling, whatever, to help them with that deficiency. Um, so that it becomes ideally some strength because they've gained knowledge in this area and they've learned how to overcome that. It can be expensive for business to do that, but it can be worth it. But ultimately, it's a business decision of 
whether or not to invest in this person to help them become better or to say, you know, they're not worth it. I'm just going to let them, you know, go do what they keep doing and eventually they'll do something and, and that'll be the end of it and, and they'll have to be let go, right? So, so that's the business decision between one and the other. How does God do this? So God says, watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, and if they repent, forgive them, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. So God's approach is that it's never a business decision. God's approach is always support, always provide the resources that you need, the people around you, the help. And here's what it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have, whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So, it's never a business decision with God. He's always going to give you the help, and he's telling us, when you're working with people, it's not a business decision for you. Always provide the support to work with each other to do what God says. So this is a recap of what we've talked about today. Um, you know, working with others to be the light, to communicate, listen, adapt your message and on a project, define, assign, and evaluate. And if there's a problem, always support. So I want to offer that to you today. So if you are in a place where you say, look, I am in a situation, I'm the one that needs the support. I'm the one that, um, you know, things aren't going right, and I really want God and the people God has set around me to support me today. Then I would like a chance to pray with you or the prayer team to pray with you. Um, so if the prayer team would come up, and then anybody that wants that support, you can get that support, and because that's God's choice always, to support you.